Towns Van Zant was a traveling troubadour whose body of work rivals that of any writer. His songs came from his life, and he lived his life with a robust abandon that made those songs some of the finest literature of the 20th century. This is the story of a true Texas legend, Towns Van Zant. Towns, where were you born and uh, where did you grow up? Well, Larry, I was born in Fort Worth in uh, 1944, March 1944. And I lived there till I was about 10, and I moved out to Midland, Texas for about a year and a half. And then we moved to Billings, Montana for about three and a half years, and then to Colorado, and then to uh, a little place out of Chicago called Barrington, at which point I went away to uh, private high school for two years. And by the time I got out of high school, my parents had moved back to Houston. And I went to the University of Colorado from high school. So mostly Texas. I would say forever a Texan, you know. And uh, secondly, uh, Colorado. I spent a lot of time in. Did you? And I, I hope to see again someday. Did you start writing as a, a young boy, write poetry and things like that? Or? Oh, well, in high school, uh, I did. We had uh, a serious, serious old English teacher who made us memorize Shakespeare. You know, and being a, a private school, it was like real, it was like eight or ten boys in a class, you know, that kind of education. Half the guys were there because uh, they couldn't be handled anywhere else. And half of the guys were there because of athletic ability, and you know some were there because of scholastic ability. And uh, I was—I kind of felt in between, pretty much. So as a result of that education, you were steeped in the classics, all the the great poets uh-huh. and Shakespeare and all that. Uh, I think a lot more so than than uh, public schools do. And I can remember—I uh, wrote a play when I was a senior, and. Uh, I wrote some uh, sonnets, you know, just the rhyme scheme is so weird, I just want to see if I could do it and uh, make any sense out of it, which I have, these days I have a couple of songs like that, that I came upon a, you know, a strange rhyme scheme and just almost academically wanted to see if I could follow it through without throwing away any lines, you know, and still have it make sense. Had you picked up a guitar by high school? Were you putting your poems to music? I I started, uh, I guess, uh, shortly after the Christmas, after I saw Elvis Presley on the Ed Sullivan Show, which I would have been nine years old, I guess. And uh, I saw that show with my older sister and her two girlfriends because we had one of the few TVs in the neighborhood back then. And I saw the effect that Elvis had on these girls. And by that time, I was start, I was starting to realize girls were somehow different than boys. And I watched Elvis drill these young ladies, and I just figured, wow, he's got all the money in the world, and uh, he can have any car that he wants, and these uh, girls love him, so there must be something to the guitar. So I asked my father if I could have one for Christmas. He said, well, if I promise to learn Fraulein, the first song. And I promised him I would, and I did, and I got one for Christmas, and still sing Fraulein. Do you recall the first time you played something that you wrote yourself for an audience that wasn't your family? Well, pretty much. It was at the Jester Lounge in Houston, Texas, out Westheimer. And it was kind of the tail end of the uh, folk boom. The, kind of the very tail end. But it was still going on enough to where uh, the jester would have uh, five or six people play on any given night, you know, three or four songs each. And uh, it would be full almost every night, you know, and the cover charge was two bucks or whatever. Uh, K.T. Oslin played there. Guy Clark played there. and uh, Mid-60s, right? Uh-huh. And uh, about 65, I guess, 64 or 5. And uh, I played there, and I ended up, there were these, these folks that had come up from the serious traditional folk ranks, kind of. Like Guy Clark was singing uh, Cotton Mill Girls and, you know, whaling ballads and 
traditional folk stuff. And uh, Frank Davis, famous Houston uh, character, was singing real traditional stuff and some lead belly. And uh, they all played it and sang it better than I could. So I figured I needed just some different stuff. And I started writing the first uh, about 15 or 20 songs were kind of geared for the beer crowd. You know, kind of some of them off color and uh, a lot of talking blues and this, that, and the other. I mean, seriously geared for the beer crowd. I became the uh, house opening act at the Jester, and they would bring people through, so I got to see all these people. I got to see uh, Alan Dameron in his prime, and uh, he really impressed me. I mean, he put, it still does, I'm sure, a serious show, you know, entertainer wise. It used to, it used to just, I would just be awe stricken that Alan would change shirts between sets. That always, that was all right. And I got to see Doc Watson, and I got to meet Lightning Hopkins. And uh, this whole time, open and Jerry Jeff Walker, and uh, opening him for these guys. I just kind of began to realize that if I was really, I was in, going to the University of Houston at that time, and uh, I was seriously being torn between staying in school and pre-law and uh, playing the guitar. And the guitar, like, slowly won out. It was, it was a case of uh, law school losing out as much as the guitar winning out. <laughs> now, Bob Dylan had been around for four or five years then releasing uh, records. Had he been uh, any influence on your writing at well, all? Well, he was a big influence in that... Uh, Jerry Jeff was, kind of, was a big influence because he, all those people that I played with and opened for, Jerry Jeff was kind of the first one that really wrote his own stuff back when uh, Little Bird, you know, his own songs. Rambling, gambling, stuff like that. And I realized that that's what I'd been doing. I'd just been doing kind of a lighter version of it all. And then uh, I think I clicked and I, I started writing serious, more serious, trying to write more serious stuff then, which uh, turned out was not hard. It kind of was where I should have been, or it's where I evolved to. And uh, I remember distinctly the first uh, serious material I ever wrote was Waiting Around to Die, which is pretty serious. Well, there's a beautiful mm -hmm. song on that, uh, Our Mother of the Mountain album, which you've recorded uh, since then as well, Tecumseh Valley, which really has the feel of a folk song to it, uh, one well, that was passed down song. rather than written. Uh -huh. Can you tell I us kinda, about I writing that song? about to do that. Well, I wrote that when I was at a, uh, the uh, house uh, entertainer at the 11th Door which used to be on, is now, what, Symphony Hall? Is that what it is? Symphony Square. They redid that whole... I mean, it would have been easier to tear down the old building, I think, and build Symphony Square. Somehow they, they built Symphony Square around the old 11th door. And uh, I was the uh, kind of house act there until uh, the IRS padlocked it. And uh, lived right up the street, up the hill toward the Capitol on 11th Street, upstairs, and uh, tinkered around with the banjo back then and wrote that song, set out to write a folk song. And uh, it was written on the banjo. And uh, I heard the only other song that I know of that being consciously done was uh, by Steve Gillette and uh, his friend, whose name was Tom Campbell, wrote uh, Darcy Farrell for a college they were taking a folklore course in college, and the assignment was to write a folk song. And I sang Darcy Farrell for years, thinking it was a folk song. You know, I looked on the map to where the truck he ran through, Virginia, you know. And then I met Steve Gillette and found that out. Tombs of Valley is kind of like that. Was it based on a true story that you had heard, or did you make up the story? No, it was, it was very loosely based on, a, I think, a one girl when I sing it, and still do. A lot of your songs are just beautiful love songs. Um, what was the inspiration uh, for If I Needed You? Where'd that song come from? 
Well, it is a pretty simple song. A lot of people play it at weddings, I found out. And uh, it so happens that it's, that song is unique in the fact that uh, it's the only song that I ever wrote in my sleep. I was dead, dead asleep. And it was kind of a weird sleep. I was living with, uh, staying with Guy Clark and Susanna Clark in this little teeny uh, house over in East Nashville. And somebody got the flu, and so we immediately all, three of us, had the flu. And we were getting a bottle of uh, codeine cough syrup every day and splitting it three ways. And we had to draw straws who walked up to the, the uh, you know, corner, which was about a quarter of a mile, to the drugstore. Because guys, VW didn't run as usual to get the cough syrup. And I always lost, it seems like. They were looking at Tennessee. They were looking at me like scum of the earth because I was buying this codeine cough syrup. You know, and I was coughing. My eyes were running. I mean, if anybody ever needed it, and they still looked at me like scum of the earth. <laughs> but anyway, so my sleep was just saturated with these technicolor dreams, most vivid dreams you can imagine. And uh, I was laying on my little bed. It was a little kind of storeroom, and it was a mattress on the floor with a little light beside it. And I always had a pad and a pencil there and some books and stuff, and my guitar was against the wall. And I was sleeping one night, and I had a dream, and I dreamt that I was, you know, a, a traveling folk singer, and I was up in front of these people, and I sang this song, and it was If I Needed You. And uh, it was so uh, intense that it woke me up, and uh, I reached over and turned on the light and wrote down the words. There's three verses to that song, and then the first verse is repeated. And I knew the, the guitar part had been so clear that I didn't even uh, get off the mattress and go get my guitar. I remembered it, and I just uh, went back to sleep. And in the morning, we all got up, kind of had coffee and stuff like that. And after that, I said, hey, uh, God, listen to this song. And I played If I Needed You with the guitar part. It's never been changed. I played it right the first time. And, you know, and he said, man, that's a beautiful song. That's yours? I said, yep. He said, when did you write it? Uh, last night. And uh, I said, no, man, we, you went to sleep before we did. You can't, I mean, you couldn't have. Did you, get, did you get up? And it was like, no, I wrote it in my sleep. And I wrote it down. I woke up long enough to write it down. It's like, wow, that's amazing, man. That's a good one. And I talked to you, you know. My first thought was, man, i got to get some more of that codeine cough syrup. <laughs> I thought about walking in and telling the doctor that I just have an open-ended prescription for codeine cough syrup because I needed to make a living, you know. To <laughs> right, I figured, well, that probably wouldn't fly. I, did, I had to change, Larry, one line in that song. You know where it goes, uh, um, ladies with me now. Since I showed her how. Since I showed her how to lay her lily hand in mine. Well, that line in the dream was, she lowed like a cow <laughs> when I showed her how. And I sent it off to New York, and they kind of called back to the publishing company, and it was kind of towns. That's a beautiful song, but, I mean, lowed like a cow, you don't think that's a bit much? Well, okay. Now, the song that you're probably most well-known for, Poncho and Lefty, uh, you're just... Uh, Outside of Dallas when you wrote that one. Uh -huh. 30 miles north of Denton. <laughs> Tell us the story about that song, how it well, came to that, you. That uh, song, I, because of uh, Billy Graham and the Guru Maharaji playing Dallas the same time I did, uh, there were no hotel rooms anywhere around Dallas. And uh, my friend Daniel and I ended up in this run crummy little rundown place with no Coke machine. No TV, no telephone, and uh, it was about 50 miles out of town was the closest we could get because uh, Billy Graham drew like 500,000 people from all over the world, and the guru drew like 300,000. So every room within 60 miles of Dallas was taken. And I sat there for three days, and we would drive, had a three-day gig, and we'd drive into Dallas and play the gig, drive back to this hotel room. And about the second or third day, I decided what I'm going to do is sit down in this chair and write a song. And I'm not going to move. 
which wasn't terribly difficult because there was nowhere to move to. <laughs> you know, I could get out and walk out and take a look at the bullfrog in the broken swimming pool. And uh, I sat there for about three or four hours and uh, through the window this, that line, first line came. Living on the road, my friend was going to keep you free and clean. And then something took over. That's another one of the ones I was talking about. The only, the only conscious thought, particular thought I had about that song was uh, it's not about Pancho Villa. I knew that for a fact. Other than that, it just kind of came. I, I made no major, I made, I added a verse. I added the last verse. I went in the uh, second night and played it at the Rubiot Club and uh, uh, my friend, late friend B.W. Stevenson was there. And he was a good friend of mine, and he, he sat there and listened to us. I said, hey, B.W., here's a new song. Because he was about the only one in the audience. Everybody else was either Billy Graham or the Guru. And I played it. <clears throat> he said, yeah, man, that's a good song, but uh, I don't think it's finished. Okay? So the next day, I wrote the uh, third verse, and it kind of came to also. Had you been carrying the characters, Poncho and Lefty, around in your head? No, not before that day. I'd never thought of either one. Tell me about how you met Blaze Foley and uh, some of those early adventures you had with Blaze. <laughs> well, I met. I was playing the Bitter End in New York, and uh, Blaze came down. And it was kind of the last night, I think, of that gig. It was like a four-day, three-day type deal, and uh, I finished playing. And uh, up walks this strange-looking guy, and he introduced himself and said he was uh, Blaze Foley and uh, from uh, Texas, and he'd heard about me and. Uh, He's from Austin, and I hadn't been to Austin too much for a while because I was living in Nashville and been on the road. We became immediate uh, friends, and uh, there's two Texans, two West Texans in New York, and I'd been there kind of before, and he never had, uh, but he had a room at the Gramercy Park Hotel, which is a hotel a lot of us stay at, and somebody, some well-meaning record guy had given Blaze the... Uh, power to sign his own tab, his, I mean, carte blanche room tab, anything you could sign for in the hotel. And so I moved in with Blaze. I moved out of my hotel and moved in with Blaze, and he was supposed to stay there for however many days to do something, meet somebody. And we uh, bankrupted the record company. We, had, we were just drove room service into the ground. We'd order like, uh, you know, 30 tequila sunrises, you know, one uh, hamburger cut in half and tip the guy, old black man, 60 or 70 bucks. And when this went on day and night for uh, three days until the record company heard about it and arranged for us to fly to Nashville. <laughs> it was cheaper to fly us to Nashville where I lived than it was to, you know, put up with Blaze. It was wild times. So there was a bunch... Every day with Old Blaze was kind of a some sort of an adventure. Oh, he cut an album in Muscle Shoals. You went to Muscle Shoals for those sessions, yeah. didn't you? That was a real adventure. I have a you know a song Blaze's Blues, which that's kind of that little trip was kind of mentioned, and uh, that that kind of almost the same thing happened. I just had a new uh, son born, my wife and I, and uh, I'd planned it to be home until. Will was, you know, a month old or so, and go back and play gigs. I get this call from Blaze, and he's in Alabama, and he uh, he's in Atlanta at that point, and he's going to do a record in Muscle Shoals with this bunch of guys, and he wants me to be there. I told him, Blaze, I've already, I can't, I just can't. I mean, we had a baby uh, a day and a half ago or so. And he was like, oh, man, you got to, you know, just wouldn't be the same if you weren't here, too. I, Blaze, I, you know, I can't, this is the best pickers in the world. There's nothing I can add. I mean, I can't hardly sing harmony, you know, this, that, and the other. And he said, well, you probably sing some harmony, and, uh, you know, you just be around. I'd have a buddy to hang around with, this, that, and the other. And he kept calling and calling. I kept saying no. And finally, it just got to work just to keep him from calling. It's like, okay. But you have to get your friend, your record company, to buy the tickets. And 
I'll fly to Atlanta. You know, we can ride in your uh, record company's private airplane, which was part of the argument why I should go. They, they had their own airplane, and I was going to be treated like royalty and this and that and the other, So, which didn't make much difference to me. But finally, just because Blaze was calling me day and night, I just decided, well, I'll go for a couple of days, a few days. So we got there. I got to Atlanta, met his uh, young uh, these young guys are our age, you know, who owned this record company and had a private plane and had uh, a bunch of gold chains on. I noticed that right off. And uh, got in their private plane and flew to Muscle Shoals and landed. And somebody picked us up and drove us to a hotel, motel. And uh, the head guy from the record company told Blaze and I that we were to wait at the hotel. They checked us in. We were to wait at the hotel for uh, two days. First, it started uh, until the next day because they were going to go check on trading this airplane for another airplane. So we go into the hotel. And I found out as soon as we got to the hotel room that they had given Blaze uh, $300 cash. So there we are. Don't know anybody in northern Alabama. $300. And it didn't take us any time at all to figure out the logistics were, you called a cab, and uh, you took a uh, about six-minute cab ride across the Tennessee River where you bought a pint of vodka, and then a six-minute cab ride back. The cab ride was $5. So we figured that out right away. And we sat there, and we watched a football game, and, you know, just uh, very serene and cool, waiting for him the next day, the next morning. The next morning came, and uh, no record company, because it to be 10 or 11 noon. So we take another cab ride. We get a fifth of vodka, come back to the room. And uh, that night, still no record company, no word. And it got started dawning on me like, please. Yeah, and you know, I think I know what kind of guys you're mixed up with. And, I mean, they're not thinking about you sitting here in this uh, hotel room. You know, I mean, it may be a week before they get back. And so Blaze kind of kicked into gear. Maybe he shouldn't even have said that, but Blaze kind of kicked into gear. And it ended up after about four days. Blaze is telling me he's like over peeking through the curtains. He's claiming to see Iranians with uh, Uzi submachine guns around the pool and stuff like that. And I was trying to keep him under control and... Uh, Finally, I decided I can't stand anymore. And I was like no angel this whole time. And we've been in this one little room. It got to where Blaze wouldn't leave the room. <laughs> it was terrible. And uh, I got on the phone and I decided, well, I'm going to get Guy Clark to uh, send me enough money and I'm going to take a bus to Nashville. And once I'm in Nashville, I can somehow get a plane ticket back to Texas and I'll be home and Blaze can do his record but things by then were like much uh, you know beyond what I was you know best laid plans of mice and men but anyway I got on the phone to call a uh, guy and uh, I don't know what Blaze, who Blaze thought I was phoning but uh, he jumped over the bed and uh, ripped the phone out of the wall at which point the uh, <laughs> and the whole room was pretty much his half of the room, at least, was trash. And uh, when the phone was ripped out of the wall, the uh, motel operator became real interested and uh, came up to see if everything was all right. I don't know what Blaze said to him at the door of the room, but uh, he retreated and called the, the uh, Florence, Alabama police, who arrived. And uh, I was put into the uh, unenviable pos position of being the peacemaker, which was all I managed to do was keep Blaze from being beaten to death and maybe even shot, you know, by these Alabama police who just, Blaze was in a rage, which he really could go into sometimes. I've seen Blaze at his most gentle and his most outrageous, and uh, the Alabama cops were not amused and <laughs> being called Nazi pigs and such by this screaming giant hippie. 
And uh, one of them was, at uh, one point, one of them was reaching for a club, and the other one was reaching for his gun. So I jumped in the middle and talked as fast as I could about uh, Blaze was really okay. He was just drunk, and we've been here four days. Blah, 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 blah. So they just uh, handcuffed Blaze, threw him in the back, and then kind of looked around at me. And I thought for an instant, you know, just a brief flashing minute that uh, they were going to let me go. And I couldn't, I mean, what was I going to do? I didn't have any money. They certainly weren't going to let me back in the motel. The, you know, and uh, anyway, one of them said, take that SOB too, <laughs> handcuffed. <laughs> and woke up in the Florence, Alabama jail, which is one of the worst places I've ever been. 30 or 40 minutes later, the people that had picked us up at the airport came and picked me up and drove around the courthouse a couple more times, and there, there was Blaze. So we're here, a happy little crew was back. The owners of the record company were still gone on whatever errand it was. And uh, I got word that the uh, the uh, owners were mad, I mean, blazingly angry at me for throwing a wrench into their record operation. And this is after I'd been drug away from my day-and-a-half-year-old kid, told I was going to be treated like royalty. And all of this had happened. And I just said, man, that's enough for me. I, you know, they were saying, boy, you, boy, you're lucky. What's the name and what's the name aren't here, man. And, uh, I said, well, you just give me 10 bucks. Give me enough money for a, a uh, bus ticket to Nashville. And buy me a half pint of vodka and a Coke and drop me off at the bus station. And I, you won't ever have to worry about me again. I don't want to talk to anybody about anything anymore, and uh, which they did. You know, and Blaze felt terrible about it. And uh, the next bus to Nashville was about four hours, five hours, and they drove they drove back up a couple of times uh, because Blaze had explained the whole situation and told them that I had saved his life and it wasn't my fault. And da, 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 my poor baby was at home. And da, 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 da. and finally, found out the owners also got the information, and I got. Uh, they apologized, you know, and by this time I was back in Texas. I was, uh, I can't remember uh, being as mad at a big, at a group of people as, right? And they were, they were, they would come back by and say that the owners had decided that it would be perfectly all right if I stayed around. It was just like the buses in two more hours. Oh, and you want to just hang around with us? You don't want to sit here in the bus station. I'll just sit here. Thank you very much. And then, like, you, I didn't know that record ever came out, but, uh, he told me he did. And, uh, shortly after that, the owners were indicted for, I think, conspiracy to, uh, you know, sell drugs or something. I heard the FBI ended up with the masters to that album. And the FBI got one of Blaze's records. I hope they listen to it. Towns, you've got a song that so far at this recording has not appeared on any of your records, but it's a, a song about one of the topics that's in the forefront of American thought, and that's homeless people. Your song, Marie, would you tell me about that song? Well, I was in a uh, hotel room in Los Angeles. It's kind of the only song that I've kind of picked out what uh, I wanted to write about, and which makes it, uh, I guess, a topical song. I don't have hardly many uh, topical, straight topical songs, you know, unless you kind of stretch, you know, you can stretch almost anything into some kind of topic, you know. I suppose most of mine are like spiritually topical. And this is, I think Marie's pretty much a straight topical song. I'd like to, uh, you know, do more. But I knew in advance I'm going to write a song about the homeless. That I had that idea, you know, before the first line came. And uh, <clears throat> I wrote it in, in uh, one afternoon in a hotel room in Los Angeles and uh, played it the first time that night. Which I was traveling with my old buddy Guy Clark, and it just amazed him. But it, you know, he's done that before too. He like he kind of he generally crafts his songs a little more. And the idea of just having the idea for one the night before, and writing it the next afternoon, and playing it that night, just he thought he thought that was amazing. But it just uh, you know it happened that way. I, th I think it's a real powerful song. I wish Blaze could have heard that song, Blaze, who we. I talk about a lot. It's an old friend of both of us. Because uh, he was really interested in uh, 
you know, the dispossessed in, in the world, in America and in the world. And uh, I thought about Blaze a lot while I was writing that song. You know, I wasn't writing it about him or anything, but uh, part of the reason I wrote it was, you know, because uh, he had so much to do with turning me on to that problem. And he had just recently passed when you wrote that uh-huh. song. Yeah, I'm convinced he had a lot to do somehow with that song. One of your uh, most recent songs is a visit into uh-huh. Netherworld, The Whole. Tell me about that song and then play it for us. Would you do that? Well, The Whole is, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, I didn't mean it to be autobiographical, but I'm sure it is, and it is for a lot of people. It's just kind of uh, losing your way in the uh, pleasures of this life, getting bogged down with the with the wrong, uh, getting bogged down under the wrong value system, you know, which has happened to me, and I, I've, you know, I still deal with it all the time, but I've, you know, managed to pull myself <clears throat> up a bit from it. It's always, you know, I've never been the stablest of people. But I'm doing real, real well now for the last uh, five or six years with an occasional hard time. But uh, 10 or 15 years ago, there was nothing much into my life except uh, self-gratification, one form or another. You know, and then also the, uh, you know, heavy, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, there's just been, I never got along with life uh, very well. And that song is kind of about those days and uh, you know there's other people a whole lot of people that have been through that that'll understand this song I'm sure is that a hard song to write or did that just come out well, real quick like a little, some of those it, it took a, a little bit of uh, a little bit of crafting but I kind of knew where it was going you know the whole time I mean it didn't come out in a rush like uh uh, Mr. Mudd and Mr. Gold, which is kind of, you know, has, they have some things in common. They're both kind of spoken and they're both in a minor key. It took a little, took a couple of days. And the, the name of the whole was just put on it for easy. I mean, I never, I never left, believed uh, too much in titles. You know, you get real wound up in titles when what you're supposed to be wound up in the song. So, uh, after I thought about this title or that title or the other title, uh, Janine just said, well, let's just call it The Hole. That's good. The Hole. And a friend of mine said uh, should be uh, called Green-Eyed Lady of the Lowlands. <laughs> <laughs> you did some uh, road work with Cowboy Junkies. You played uh, a long yeah, tour was, with them. That was right? a long tour. That was my first uh, or my only like, serious bus tour with where you carry your whole you know, they carry all of their own lights, their own sound. That whole crew was, I think, uh, 24 people. The Count and Roadies and the Junkies and me. The road manager and the production manager. It was real interesting. It was real fun and interesting. There was two buses. One for the Roadies and one for the Cowboy Junkies and me and the road manager. And uh, one big, great big semi it was... Uh, Two months with a little break. It was about two months and about uh, 45 gigs or so. It's real interesting. The roadies were amazing to break down the whole stage, you know, and travel and have the whole stage set up by the time we got there for the sound check. The sound checks were just like everything. I've never seen crews like that work before. These were concert halls as opposed to bar rooms. <clears throat> uh, there were... Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, renovated theaters, you know. And a, we had a, an occasional uh, bar sort of setting, but they were like giant bars, like the uh, Texas Opry House type bars. Just the average audience was about 2,000 or whatever. You don't specifically write songs for other people, but in this case you did write a song for uh-huh. Cowboy Junkies. That's, that's did you the, write it during the tour or after? Uh-huh, during. And I would... T- I would uh, take what I'd written to Michael a certain line what do you, Michael what do you think about he's the leader of the, the elder brother of the junkies Margo is his sister and uh, Pete the drummer is their other brother the original band was uh, was uh, Michael and 
Al, the bass player, and they played together, and then they got Margo and Pete in on it, long, whenever that was, a long time ago. But I'd take it to Michael, we, we'd all become like family in it, just for an experiment. So what do you think about this line? Do you think that's too goofy? Oh, no, man, that's great. And I just worked on it for a couple of few weeks to where at the end I had to tell them if I got it finished and uh, right about when the tour was ended, and I told them that I'd make a get it to where I knew it and make a demo of it and send it to him. And I told him, like, look, don't feel like you have to record this, you know. And I just wrote it for y'all and, and in, the, in their presence and everything. And I, and I really, I was serious. I didn't want him to feel like, God, we had to, you know, you know, I let him know that I wasn't going to feel bad or hurt or anything if they just put it, just kept it. So I just did it to see if I could do it. It was real fun. And lo and behold, they did uh, record it. Which is nice. They recorded that, wrote a song called Towns is Blues, and also uh, mm-hmm. put out a single of uh, To Live Is To Fly, right? Uh-huh. Well, I think it was the uh, flip side of the single. Or it was one of the songs on the single, I think. Lightning Hopkins, uh, big influence on your guitar playing. Uh, did you ever meet Lightning? Spend any oh, yeah. time with him? Well, a bit. I played with him, you know, the same shows quite a bit. And I opened for him a lot. And the gesture, I've been to his house a few times at the uh, Shea Orleans apartment. And, uh, you know, we became, he kind of, he, he knew me, he knew, who, you know, who I was. I don't think he ever quite got my name straight. But my friend and uh, played bass with me for a long time, Rex Bell, ended up uh, playing with Lightning for uh, seven or eight years. So that was kind of, you know, I think it was because they both make the same mistakes at the same time or they're not even really mistakes but they'll leave out a bar and they happen to do it kind of at the same time you know and uh, after eight years of gigs he kept calling Rex Rick and uh, Rex corrected him a couple of times Lightning it's Rex not Rick it's Rex okay Rick so after a couple of times of that it was just Rick forever so any trouble he had with my name I just kind of didn't even think about it but I did learn that he kind of I learned from lightning from records of lightning before I ever saw him I I remember when I saw him I was surprised I was just looking through a newspaper in Houston I'd been at uh, turned on to him in high school and then in college at the University of Colorado is where I really started listening you know and when I saw his name at the Bird Lounge Lightning Hopkins the Bird Lounge for uh, three bucks I was just floored I hadn't even been looking at him as a human you know, or much less a human that was still alive or that would play somewhere that I could go. Right? I was. I remember the first night of seeing Lightning and sitting down at his table afterwards. But uh, anyway, I learned from Lightning that uh, you can hit very different notes, you know, on the guitar as opposed to... Uh, strumming you know like as opposed to uh, this you know you can you know you know you know what I mean your song uh, Brand New Companion uh, sounds like Lightning Hopkins could have written that song uh, yeah uh, that's a, I wrote it for that reason, just a lightning, uh, little lightning tribute, so like kind of a cheap imitation of lightning. You know, he was, I mean, he was a, quite the guitar player. Towns Van Zant died at the age of 52 on New Year's Day, 1997, the anniversary of the death of Hank Williams. He toured and recorded until the final days of his life. One of Towns' last recordings was a duet with Barb Donovan of his song, I'll Be Here in the Morning. 